as we've done each and every week on the Rita Panahi Show. Let's bring in the author of international bestsellers, including The War on the West, The Strange Death of Europe and The Madness of Crowds. Douglas Murray, it's been wonderful to speak with you uh, throughout the year and for this last time in 2023, but we'll have you back in 2024. Uh, whether you like it or not, you're coming back, Douglas. Uh, let's start with uh, the shameful performance of presidents of prestigious colleges, including Harvard, MIT and Penn. This was at a congressional hearing where they refused to label anti-Semitism and calls for genocide as harassment. Here's Liz McGill as an example. She's the president of the University of Pennsylvania. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment, yes. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. Douglas. It is the easiest question to answer yes to. How do we get here where universities are so openly hostile to mainstream views, like, I don't know, believing there are only two genders, but calling for the genocide of Jews needs further context? Uh, first of all, it's the result, as the Israeli president told me in an interview yesterday, of decades of moral rot in the universities. As you say, Rita, these are places where people have lost their jobs because they've identified the fact of biological sex and haven't been willing to lie about it. These are institutions that have banned, for instance, members of the Trump administration from speaking on campus. Um, mm. These are institutions that have spent years telling us all about microaggressions, which don't seem to care very much about the biggest form of aggression imaginable, genocide, who've told us all about, you know, hurty, hurty feelings and the importance of stamping out hate, and who can't condemn the most obvious and evil and prominent form of hate in history when it's put to them in Congress. I mean, none of these people are fit for mm. purpose. Uh, I said when I heard, when I saw these smirking responses from people like that president of, uh, of the Penn State University, you know, the the sort of I could I worked out first like what's she doing? Why has she got this like knowing grin on her face? And I realized, well, first of all, I realized, mm. it's of course sort of legalese, isn't it? It's this kind of I'm going to give you a clever legal answer that doesn't leave my institution open to to um, legal. Uh, cases brought by, for instance, Jewish students for harassment. So she thought she was doing something terribly clever. You know, what also, finally, I, I, said, I thought, Rita, was this, th these people were talking like chat GPT. They were just ro rolling out this answer. <laughs> and as it happened, I actually asked the same questions that these le leaders of major universities in America were asked. I asked the same question to ChatGPT, and ChatGPT got it right, said actually calling for genocide <laughs> is regarded as being unacceptable. So here's the interesting thing. We've got to such a state in our universities that the people who lead the universities in America are actually less moral than AI. This is a frightening development. It really is. And and like the Israeli president said, it's it's about a clash of civilizational values. And I want to bring you this clip. This is one of the leaders of the critical race theory movement, Ibrahim X. Kendi, who explains in this clip why, in his opinion, white folks are disconnected to humanity. I, I don't think uh, white uh, people worldwide have really reckoned with how much their own personal identity is shaped by constructions of whiteness and, and how much um, that construction of whiteness uh, prevents uh, white people from uh, connecting to humanity. 
Douglas, this man is hugely influential, particularly in academia and, and the corporate world. The former CEO of Twitter gave his organisation $10 million to spread that bile. Yes, of course, the organisation that he tried to set up at the University of Boston ended up being a, just a feast of corruption and much more. Who could have expected? Mm. It makes me, as people could probably tell from that clip, is not very bright. He tries to sort of construct ideas as he goes along and he wades through these piles of waffle. Uh, his books are pretty unreadable. I only read them because I'm paid to. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the, the man is, is, is a walking um, philosophical and moral disaster. The interesting thing about Kendi, however, is not just that he demonizes a whole race of people, he just demonizes white people in a way that would be totally unacceptable and rightly unacceptable to do about any other race. But for some reason, people seem to think at the moment it's acceptable to do about wh white people. Mm. It's not just that he does that. The interesting thing, Rita, is you say he puts himself forward for very well paid corporate gigs. But do you know one thing Ibrahim X. Kendi will not do? is to debate his ideas, to have his de his mm. ideas such as they are contested. So I'm very happy to once again say publicly uh, what I have said a couple of times before, which is I challenge Ibram X. Kendi to a debate anytime, anywhere, any place. I'm very happy to debate a motion of his choosing. I'm very happy to, for all the proceeds to go to a charity of our choice. And I'd like to see him show up once. But he has never had his facile ideas debated. And so I suggest there's a reason for that. He knows they don't stand up to scrutiny. Fine. Once again, he can reveal that fact to the public. Now to the uh, first son, Hunter Biden, who was today indicted on nine charges, including three felonies. He faces a possible 17 years in prison after spending millions on his uh, lavish party lifestyle while dodging taxes, allegedly. But, of course, this really isn't about Hunter Biden. Uh, it's about his father and whether members of the Biden family were enriching themselves selling access to the vice president and perhaps even the president. Uh, this, tell me how you see this story, Douglas. It, it's extraordinary, Rita, because this story really does seem to be sort of finding its way to a kind of culmination. Um, for years, the problem with the Hunter Biden story has been firstly that it was suppressed, of course, the New York Post's uh, Twitter account, mm. Facebook accounts, others were suppressed when they revealed the first stash of information from the famous laptop. So the first thing is there's always been this attempt to cover up the story. But the second, in a way, even bigger follow on from that is why, why is the first son uh, apparently immune from things that would be crimes if anyone else ca carried them out. Um, you know, other people aren't allowed to not pay taxes. Um, other people aren't allowed to um, uh, um, wave a, a gun they don't have the right to own around on video and sort of boast about it. They're not allowed to smoke crack and just sort of, you know, photograph themselves doing it. Um, and never mind the inference, that's even before you get to the inference peddling. There's just stuff that he's got away mm. with, which most Americans say, well, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't get away with that. And so that plays into this mm. two-tier justice system fear. But the real thing, as you say, Rita, is the, the influence peddling, where all of the millions came from to fund this lavish lifestyle. You know, um, Joe Biden has spent a life in politics in America that can make you moderately rich. It cannot make you fantastically rich unless something else is going on. Oh, there is so much to uncover there, and I, I do wonder if we're ever going to get to the bottom of precisely how much they got, the manner in which they got it, and where the money went. Did 10% or more go to the big guy, the now president? Now, before you go, you wrote a fantastic must-read piece for The Spectator about the UN and Israel. Why is the UN, Douglas, the premier forum for Israel bashing? Uh, as I say at the beginning of the piece, uh, Rita, as you know, uh, there was an old joke that the UN should have a football team. And the reply was, well, who on earth would they play? And the answer is Israel, obviously. Um, yes. The UN has, for about 50 years, been the world's premier anti-Israel inst institution in 1975. It, passed the notorious um, uh, um, 
resolution claiming that Zionism is racism, which is, is just, it, I mean, people should go and see the responses of the uh, um, American Arm thing. It reminds you of a better era of Democrat politics. Democrat Senator uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was the US UN ambassador at the time, now ambassing that uh, legislation. But in the decades since, it's just got worse. And we've learned in recent recent weeks, I mean, that the UN was incapable of passing a resolution condemning the, the Hamas massacres of October 7th. And when that failure condemn, to condemn the massacres occurred, um, there was whooping and cheering and clapping in the UN chamber. Um, that's in New York. Go over to Geneva to the Human Rights Council. And uh, the mm. government of Iran was chairing one of the recent sessions. Um, <sighs> not known for its interest in human rights, um, but the UN Human Rights Council all the time is passing motions attacking Israel, usually sort of led by, as I say, sort of Zimbabwe, North Korea and, and, and Iran. Um, <laughs> and, and then you have this step up in recent days, the discovery, for instance, from one of the, ho one of the Israeli hostages, that they were held hostage in the attic of a UN official in Gaza. And I mean, mm. even in my worst nightmares, I didn't think that the people employed by the United Nations would actually be keeping Jews captive in their attics. Um, but here we are. Gosh. And as I say in the piece, I hope mm. people can read it. You know, this, is, this is the moral rot of the UN. We've seen the moral rot of the universities in America. This is the moral rot at the heart of the most important international institution that exists. It's an absolute must-read piece in The Spectator. I encourage you to read it. Douglas Murray, thank you so much for your time again tonight. Great pleasure as always.